for, for the well, good morning. Today we're going to look at the Word of God from Matthew chapter 7. As we finish up the Sermon on the Mount, uh, either today or next week, we're going to look especially at the, the verses that talk about the wide and narrow gate of the Scripture. So I'll see if I can get that up for you there. So the, the, sometimes you think of the wide road or the, the narrow road, but it, literally it's gate or, or a door that you go through, something like that. The, uh, I've got a picture for you. It didn't turn out very well, so my apologies. This is the one that's on the, uh, the stained glass window that was made for it, and it's based on this verse that we're going to look at today. And you kind of see the narrow road or the narrow gate going up the mountain and then the waterfalls and the paradise and that goes with it but it is narrow and then of course the broad road on the other side uh it's supposed to be leading off into darkness but i always said why did they put such beautiful sky above it because it almost looks appealing to go that way too but you can see it doesn't really go anywhere it it kind of disappears that broad road uh, so the Bogan Reefs uh, thought it did a nice job. You'll notice there is a problem with our stained glass window. I did tell them about it, but it never got fixed. Anyone notice the problem? I apologize. It's kind of blurry. But if you look at the bottom corner, notice the verse. Well, it says, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many will enter through it, but uh, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. John 7, 13 to 14. It's not in John. <laughs> it's in Matthew. So I always joke when I look at that. It's got the wrong verse on, the, on it. But it is Matthew 7, 13 to 14. And I, I grew up with it as the road. But I, I will look back. It is gate uh, in the original Greek. But then I did a little bit of study on this word, and it actually can be used as if you've ever driven. Well, let's pick on Ottawa. Yeah, that's the. Isn't Ottawa have the largest main street in the United States? I think. At least that's what they claim. And the word that's used here for the uh, wide uh, gate or wide way can also mean uh, wide square. So in other words, it's a wide open space that is easy to get into. It's, it's not tight. It's just plain wide open. So enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many will enter through it. And you kind of see in John, if we want to pick on him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Um, the word for narrow is stenos. And you've heard of a stenographer, kind of shorthand. And so the idea is to squish it down to make it narrow easy to do uh so you don't have to write everything all out but or it, any of you do stenography did you is it easy <laughs> i've always been curious on that such did you yeah i know Sherilyn was pretty good at that too i i always liked her as a secretary because i could rattle on and she'd get it all <laughs> so but yeah that's the idea of shorthand or small making it small so see you all know greek <laughs> that's neat that's neat so uh so god does things a narrow way and i remember when i went to the seminary we, I had a lesson on Deuteronomy 7, and 
the the uh, the professor made the point that we always think in the New Testament for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. In other words, we're saved by grace through faith. And I remember growing up thinking that that was not taught anywhere in the Old Testament. And this professor said, you guys don't know your Bible, do you? <laughs> and so he opened up to Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, which says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your fathers, he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So you see the narrow road already in the Old Testament. The God is always doing things the narrow way. So he picks the smallest of the peoples of the earth, and then he picks the smallest family, although they end up being pretty big, 12 kids of Abraham. But but think about it. Abraham's, other than his initial faith in Haran, remember he left to go to the promised land and he, he left everything. So there's faith at the beginning of it, but then his kids are actually pretty bad. <laughs> You've got Isaac. Um, you don't hear much about him in there other than he uh, blesses the wrong kid or tries to. He's more about the firstborn getting chosen and God's more about the, the one he actually wants. Uh, Jacob. And Jacob isn't a very good guy. His very name means deceiver or heel catcher. But yet God chose him and and he kept after him. So and again, you see that God chooses the least to shame the greatest. There's a lot of places in the Bible that say that, but it's completely by grace. They just are to trust him. Um, he loves them. Simply hold on, take my hand. You, you don't earn it. It's just yours. And and so Deuteronomy has become for me and I, I, hopefully for all of you a great place. If you want to see grace and it's spelled out, really the whole book of Deuteronomy is that way and a good reminder of it. Uh, here's another one. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are my ways your ways. So we might have, think our way is the right way. Well, God is not. Okay, I want to do something. I don't know if this is fun or not, but it may be enlightening. Uh, I, if you have a favorite Bible passage, I uh, want to just share it and see if it promotes this whole narrow way. You may be surprised. Um, just curious. We don't all have to go, but or if. What's one of your favorite passages in the scripture? Jeremiah 29, 11. That's for. Yeah, that's a, that's a great passage. And if you ever read what happened right before that, Jeremiah under God's direction basically says, uh, I'm going to destroy all the people. <laughs> And you're going to go into captivity. By the way, for I know the plans I have for you towards the Lord to prosper you. It doesn't sound like you're about to prosper us, God. You're going to take us into captivity instead. So if you follow God, it might take you through some pretty awful circumstances. So if, if that's one of your favorite passages, it's a great passage, but it's not about prosperity. It's actually about going through a lot of trouble in your life before God gives you the prosperity. So it's a very narrow way. Good verse. You fit. It fit. Yeah. 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 That's a good, very good point. Any other favorite passages? Okay, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So 
Isn't that a great passage? So if I want to play volleyball, I'll be the greatest in the world as long as I pray to God. <laughs> what I just did is to misinterpret that passage majorly. <laughs> that's, that's simply reading it out of context. Uh, in context, it's talking about, I can do all things, namely, God's will. His will is going to work out no matter what. Because if if my, my ways are his ways, I'm going to seek his will, and it's going to happen because it's his will. Yeah. Great passage. Very narrow because wide is the way to destruction, namely, I'm going to become the greatest volleyball player on earth, the basketball player, the whatever it is. And it's not bad to seek high achievement. I'm not against that. But if it's merely, if my life is merely as an athlete, then I'm not doing God's ways. And that's actually why is destruction. That, that lifestyle will lead you to a horrible place. Um, yeah. So I, I found a quote uh, for the sermon on Sunday. I know none of you heard it, but I used it last night with, we had Mitchell Betsworth here and he uh, spoke about his experience in Germany. Um, and it was kind of a back to school, uh, special thing I did with a lot of our kids on Wednesday night. But one of the quotes I found is that you should work hard in the gym and put that much energy and even more into following God. So if you put a lot of energy in the gym, that's worth a lot. It'll win you a gold medal, maybe. <laughs> but if you work that hard on your faith in Christ, that's worth even more. Yeah, kind of interesting to think of. Other verses. Curious. Isaiah 41.10. What is that? I That one I can't quote. Okay. So again, it's following the Lord, which is very narrow. And did you notice in the verse, it uses the actual name of God. Isn't it all capitalized there? The very first part of the verse. Oh. Let me look it up. So 41.10. Fear not, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Oh, it just uses the regular name for God. Okay. I will strengthen you, help you. But it, it it's referring to one God. Not three gods, but you're narrowed down to the, the true God. I apologize. I didn't realize that would just use that. So other passages. Okay. Okay. Good. Be kind. Yeah, and that's very narrow. Uh, well, you probably know this more than anyone on the buses. So it's all the kids kind. <laughs> it's a different way of lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. And forgiving one another. That that's a. Tender -hearted, forgiving oh, okay. Tenderhearted. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. And, and that's narrowing the way even more particular lifestyle. Yeah. Others. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good person. Have, have yes. pity on me, my friends. Have pity for the hand of God has struck me. What do you pursue me as God does? You never get enough of my flesh? Although my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll, 
they were inscribed with an iron tube on lead or engraved in rock forever. So that's his lament. And then I know that my Redeemer lives and will stand and in the end will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Yeah, that's, that's so he goes from bad to uh, yeah. mention of the Redeemer who will be on earth and he will be reincarnated. Yeah, yeah, he'll he'll have his body. Yeah, his again, body. and he'll be able to see with his own eyes. That's very narrow. Um, I look even in our so-called Christian society, and people have some really wacky ideas of death and heaven, but. God's way is very narrow. We've got resurrected life to look forward to. In, yeah. in Job was the oldest brother. It just amazed me that the writer, mm -hmm. the writer knew yeah. what was in the future. He both knew Christ was coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. Uh, in, on Tuesdays, I usually do Bible study with uh uh, Terry in the office or whoever is in the building. Well, today we've been reading through the case for Christ. I don't know if any of you have read that book. Uh, it, this no, this this one is a uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of his name too. I'm reading it, uh, but he's a he was an investigative journalist, and he looks at all the evidence of for cases and things and he starts the book out with this uh, uh murder and it's a uh, police officer gets shot and so it's the jury looks at all the evidence and rules that it's it's a murder um, but then he gets another set of evidence and it founds out that the police officer actually had an illegal gun and accidentally shot himself and so they have to reopen the case. Uh, well, why do I bring this up? Well, because the Bible, and you made a huge point, uh, Dwayne, about how the Bible itself, if you look at all the evidence, starts out with all these truths right from the first book of the Bible all the way to the end, and it's consistent. And, and just the dating of the Bible helps with that. Uh, we actually have copies of the Old Testament older than Jesus that predict he's coming. So the church didn't make it up after. So, but if you, at one time we didn't have those old copies, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so we didn't know. Did the church just make it up? Well, when you find an old copy, no, it didn't. It actually is, is written. And they're still, I don't know if you realize this, the Dead Sea Scrolls are still being put back together again, still to this day. They don't have them all done yet. Um, they do, yeah, probably not. And because most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are little scraps of paper at the bottom of these tubes. And so to put them back together again, it's like a puzzle. They use uh, uh, DNA and they test each corner of the thing and then they match them until they put the whole document together. We found the caves that got more, and one of the things has fallen over. And they said there's 19,000 pieces on the floor of the cave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mary, Mary Rose McDaniels, I went over to her place last month, and she's got a 3,000 piece puzzle. And I thought, oh my. <laughs> oh. I looked at that and I thought, no way. <laughs> I do good at 100 pieces. <laughs> so any other passages? <laughs> oh. Like the neither the present nor future, nor yes. life nor death, yes. present future can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, or considering the 
present sufferings that we go through. There, yeah, there's a lot of good passages there. Uh, but yeah, it's very narrow, only in Jesus. Uh, uh, Psalm 23 is a favorite, probably a lot of you. Uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. I I think it's mentioned in there. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 23. I think it's like verse four, five. Yeah. So, Psalms. Yeah. Psalms 23 great great passage but it's very narrow you have to hold on to him as the shepherd and it's his rod and his staff not someone else's so again very narrow okay i think you're getting my point i probably beat a beat that enough so okay uh this is where uh the the wide gate, the word used for destruction, means ruin or loss. It can refer to physical, spiritual, or eternal destruction. And we know that's true from other parts of the scripture as well. A person that goes to hell doesn't just go there spiritually, but they go physically. So hell is a physical place, and those that are thrown there will be resurrected. So they aren't body in the ground and soul in hell. They Their body will be raised, their spirit reunited, and they will be in fire and destruction in body. So if, if that doesn't bother people, I know I've got burnt a couple times. Um, I know some people that have got burnt horrible, and it's just awful. You're always feeling unpleasant. You can't cool it. Um, so it means destruction, die, perdition, perish, uh, pernicious ways, waste. Uh, I think it's the Mormons, well, for that matter, the Jehovah's Witness, they believe in the false doctrine of annihilation. And this is very comforting to people, uh, that when you die, you are simply annihilated. So if those that believe in the Mormon or Jehovah's Witness way, uh, I believe it's Mormons, you get a second chance if you're everyday members. But us pastors, we're just done. <laughs> they, uh, they actually teach that. You Lutheran pastors, you're, you don't get hell, you just are done, gone. But you think about that. Don't atheists basically believe that too? When you die, you're done. So good, bad, doesn't matter. Just go on the ground anyway. But what, what I'm saying is this is not a, that's not what this means. It's not that you're uh, died as in no more. This is like the book of Revelation says, it's the, the second death. It's an eternal thing. Yeah. So, and broad can, this I thought was interesting, can refer to an open square to the city. Okay, now we'll bring up all the juicy stuff. Uh, liberalism in the church. Um, all people are saved by any belief. All roads lead to heaven. How many Catholics I've heard this teaching come out of their mouths? Oh, as long as they believe in God, they'll be in heaven anyway. No, doesn't work that way. That, it, yeah. So even the the Pope kind of alluded to that, not totally, but they said, well, the, remember they were doing those dialogues with other faiths. It's one. I don't mind saying things like that if we're we're talking about fellow Christians. Sure, there'll be Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans and. Catholics will be in heaven. Why? Because they're following the narrow way, namely Jesus, the narrow gate. He's the one that we go through. But if you mean somebody that doesn't even believe in Jesus, I don't think so. Um, that's 
that's the danger. But and I know some Catholics probably don't mean the Buddhist and Hindus will be in heaven, but uh oh, and, and then it gets worse. I remember when I was in uh, college, I was visiting at the nursing home. I was part of a group called Off Campus Ministries. We would uh, visit a couple times a week, a couple of nursing homes and sing. You, you probably wonder, why do I like playing music at the nursing home or like Northern Hills? Well, I've done that ever since college. And so we would sing with them and do a message. And, but we, I met a Hindu there once. And of course, we're college students. So part of the LCMS. So what is our goal? You meet a Hindu? Convert them, of course. We're great missionaries. So I go in there and and we're talking with this Hindu and say, um, do you know about Jesus? Yeah, I've heard of him. Can we tell you more about Jesus? So we we do. I think I talked with this guy for an hour. And after we're done, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, it turned out as we kept talking with him, he believed in like probably 300,000 other gods too. <laughs> they just put Jesus in with the rest of them. But it's not that way. You can't, you got to give up the others. You can't just add Jesus to the other. And, that, and I've mentioned this before, boot, or uh, down in Haiti. All these people believe in voodoo and in God. Well, you can't do that. You got to give one up. It's one or the other. Um, so, and that's the danger of the broad road. Uh, just, I'll follow Jesus when it's convenient, but otherwise I'll do my normal way. So you can't have it, put it all together. And so we live now, you've probably all heard this in postmodernism. Are all of you familiar? So modernism and so we had kind of all these eras and probably most of you grew up in the so-called modern era. And then I grew up now in the postmodern era and modern or postmodernism is basically, I like it in some ways because you can listen to any form of music you want to and it's good. So they got oldies on the radio on one channel and you've got uh, country on the next and rap and my favorite, which is Baroque. Uh, it'd be like Bach, Buxtehude, Beethoven, Mozart. Yeah, classical music. And then the next minute, you can listen to something that is like, oh, where'd that come from? And it's all good. In, in fact, you listen to musicians, some of these new art, pop artists, they will mix stuff together. Uh, what is it? The Levine? Uh, what's his name? He, he just wrote a song not too long ago. It's basically got the uh, Beethoven's Fifth built into a new brand new piece or he'll some of these writers will work it they steal all the time from the classical stuff it, it's just <laughs> it's really good or i don't know if you can see this picture Th this is a good example of postmodernism see what you got here an old baroque ornate piece that's ultra realistic the stuff that actually looks like it's supposed to look. And then you got that in there too. And that's that's postmodernism. It, it's basically, if you're a painter, if you're a musician, anything goes. Um, but notice the top tenet of postmodernism, mm -hmm. the rejection of universal truths. So what I believe is what I believe, what you believe is what you believe. You don't question what I believe. There's a lot of skepticism, uh, subjectivity, depending on your context. 
playfulness. You can kind of see that in the music, the art. Uh, fragmentation. So putting a lot of things together. Uh, my son listens to this guy on YouTube called Rumi. He, yeah, he is, he kind of got me hooked on him a little bit. <laughs> He actually mashes music together from different eras and lines it up because computers now, you can run it through AI, artificial intelligence, and move it and put a, one song into another and it actually sounds good. And, and the other thing he does is he's constantly saying what's the most popular song and then playing them and explaining where it comes from. And it's just really, really interesting. Uh, but that's postmodernism. Uh, you you grew up at a time, I guess, when well, you had rock and roll. I don't know if that was good. I'm was was it good in your family? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that's kind of going from traditional, even modernism had rules. This is the way it's supposed to be. Um, and of course, straight lines. I don't think, we don't have a lot of modernist stuff in this building. Uh, I think probably the closest to, you remember, uh, oh, what's the architect, uh, Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Wright, he, all the straight lines. Uh, he designed chairs that were weird looking, but they were very functional. The idea of modernism is you're gonna make something that really works well. There's still universal truth and they look for it. So design has proportion to it, but that was stolen even earlier than that. Uh, but there was questioning going on in modernism. And then that kind of led to the, the postmodernism. And the problem is this moved into not just art and music and those areas, it moved into everything. It moved into Christianity as well. So now we're gonna question everything. The good part about this, I think some things needed to be questioned like politics, <laughs> Some government institutions need to be questioned. Uh, don't just take their word for it just because they say it. Uh, well, we're seeing that a lot right now, right? You'll get a leader get up there and if they think if they just say it enough times, it's true. That not that what advertisement does? They try to say it, boom, 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 over and over again. You start believing it. But postmodernism would question and say, eh, I don't know about that. That's probably why all these right now, anyone watched the debate last night? I, yeah. I still haven't heard what happened. In this. What was it? That's, oh, it's on Fox. Okay. Was it good? Well, my guess is we'll probably start hearing some of it today. I, I'm gonna probably follow up. I'm curious what they did. Uh, but it, it, it'll be interesting to, when you actually listen to the debate itself, you find out what the individuals believe uh, versus what everybody else is saying they believe. <laughs> I can't really. Did he get it? Oh. He made it very clear that he was Christian. Oh, that's good. Yeah, in theory, by doing that, he identified with the narrow way. And so this rejection of universal truth, in theory, a whole group of people will reject him just because he said this is the way. Uh, or it could help him. I don't know. Uh, it helps it among those that actually believe there's one way. The other thing about postmodernism that I think is good, even though it's bad, 
is even though everybody rejects universal truth. Okay, that's not true. Everybody has their own universal truth. We're actually willing to listen to other people. So for example, if I stand up in a public place and start telling my story, most people will actually listen if it's my story. Because remember, postmodernism says that um, they reject universal truth, but they're willing to listen to individuals. Um, so if I tell my story of how I became a Christian, people want to hear that. And they'll go, oh, yeah, that's his truth. So there is an opening for evangelism still today, uh, right in postmodernism. Because most people won't just say, well, that's, that's false. They'll at least want to hear the story. Uh, because you have your truth, I have my truth. Uh, okay. So there, this whole section of the Bible is about this narrow way. So last, or two weeks ago, we did the judging. And before that, we did the Lord's. This is all kind of summarized in that there's one way to do this. And I have somebody read uh, here. I've done too much talking. I got to get you guys back going again. Stuffed out for false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do, you, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. So notice the false prophet is the Broadway. It's going to lead... This prophet's going to lead the wrong way. The whole Old Testament's full of all, all these false prophets. Uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel are constantly preaching against people like Cananiah. And uh, I think there's one called like Achaia. And they basically said, well, if you keep saying, yes, yes, the Lord is going to bless you. Well, you're going to die. That's basically what the prophets do. They say, it does, don't just say whatever you think. Um, so how do you tell if a prophet's true or not? Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Be a Berean. Become a Berean Baptist. <laughs> no, don't leave the Baptist part out. Become a, a Berean, one that actually looks it up. See if, see if the pastor or church what they're teaching is true or not. And one of the fastest ways you can find out is if they if they cherry pick Bible passages. They'll just pull a passage out and go, up oh, here, like we did earlier, Sharon, your passage uh, with, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then they say, well, I'm going to become the president of the United States now. Well, maybe. <laughs> Are you a good uh, leader so but check them out what's what's the other thing i didn't write these down but i'm guessing all of you know these already so check the scripture if what they prophesy comes true then you know it's a true prophet if they uh, what they predict does not happen then throw them out and stone them to death. That's what the Old Testament says. Uh, okay, we, we don't have authorization to stone all the uh, uh, many denominations today, but but it, it is. It's it's worth worth listening. If they predict the end like the Mormons do and the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower magazine, and all those things, I, those two religions should be done. They predicted the end of the world so many times and it hasn't happened. I just don't get it. What, why people continue to follow that or some of the others. Yeah. So you, now notice he says you can recognize them here by the fruit. Are they, well, Cheryl, we could use all these passages. Are they kind? Are they... Do they forgive? Do they uh, point to Jesus? Uh, then you know they're they're legit. 
I would love to pick thorn or grapes from a thorn bush. <laughs> yeah. 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 Figs from thistles. We had grape vines when I was in Lakeview and I cut them all the way down the ground and then they came up and produced abundantly. And then the next year they all died. <laughs> I'm not a very good gardener. <laughs> yeah, I think I overdid it a little bit, but so, okay, next, next verses, 18 to 20. Good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I okay. guess you could use this for raising kids. I, I didn't use this particular one with our family, but we did use a number of other ones. You know, in disciplining, I'd often say, well, you know, God sees what you're doing wrong, too. And and it, you need to say you're sorry to God and to uh, to me and your mom. And they would, because they realize that's a, that's a bad thing. And then we pray and ask for forgiveness. But here, uh, you know, a bad tree. If you keep doing those wrong things, God's going to eventually cut you down. That's yeah. it. it uh, is heavy. I just did a, I think about three days ago, all of you know, I've been reading this Martin Luther devotion. It's really good. Uh, I should, I would love to order copies for everybody in the congregation, but I'd go broke. They're, they're kind of expensive. I wish they were cheaper, but the, yeah, there we go. Just for this group. Yeah. Yeah. They are really good, but it's, this last, I think it was about three days ago, it pointed out that the righteous, Luther was pointing out, like it when their bad fruit is revealed. And then we've realized that, oh, I've got some bad fruit going on here and I'm going to be punished. And the reason we like that is because then we give it to God and then we're forgiven. But people of the world do it the opposite way. If you point out they're wrong, they get mad. Because, oh, how dare you show my uh, what's wrong in my life. And, and, and so we like it because it gives us fear of God. But the people of the world, they don't fear the consequences of their sin. They fear just fear itself. Oh, I, I'm going to eventually die. So their fear is directed at the wrong thing. So instead of being afraid of God, they're afraid at the evil in the world. Something I never really thought about with, uh, uh, and, and Luther was talking about Jonah when he was writing about that. You remember what happened to Jonah? He was on the boat and it's, it's going to sink. So what does Jonah do? He says, I did it. I did the wrong. Just get it over with. Throw me in the water. I'll die for my sin. And Luther points out he knew he needed to confess his sin. <laughs> and he, he, before God, whereas the sailors, they're not scared of his sin. They're scared of they're going to die. Um, and so ironically, afterwards, they all praise God. <laughs> And Jonah's in the swallowed by the fish. So the sailors are all saved and Jonah's in the belly of the fish. So anyway, okay. Um, let's, what does a good prophet look like? Let's close with this. Uh, there's a couple passages in the New Testament, Titus and Timothy. Both uh, have an explanation of what an uh, uh, elder, or you could say a, a prophet or a pastor looks like. Okay. The reason I left you in Crete is that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, man whose children believe and are not open 
to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not spectacular, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly, firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Okay. Notice the good fruits. You, you can actually see if somebody's a Christian or not by what they do. Notice the uh, blameless, faithful to the wife. Um, and there's children who believe. They're not going to be out partying too much. <laughs> I got to watch out here. I've got teenagers in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to give Micah a little bit of credit. I was impressed with that that kid. Um, he says, Dad, can I have uh, kids over the house? I said, what are you going to do? He says, we're going to have hot dogs and chips. I said, okay, what time? So he ends up calling his uh, section for band, and they come over the house. I was impressed. I, and it wasn't a, you know, a wild, crazy drinking party or something, which is easy to get into. Um, and so, I don't know. I have to give him a little kudos. Uh, pray for that kid. I, I think God is going to do something with him. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and I think pray for all your kids too. I, God does something. And then this isn't just elders, but but really we want that for all our families, that they grow up that way and, and continue. Pray for them even after they're out of the house. Yeah. So, so this is a sign of a true believer, good fruit is happening. We aren't saved by the good fruit. I'll be a good Lutheran and put the tagline on. Um, we aren't saved by all those things. Uh, you could end up being the thief on the cross, and that's your last good thing you ever did is believe. But but especially a prophet, there should be some good stuff going on in their life. Uh, in fact, they're not supposed to be newly converted. You don't want a brand new, uh, somebody that just became a Christian to be your pastor or the apostle or something like that, because they might fall away because um, they haven't gone through the testing, uh, been, been on the narrow road very long because it can get tough. And then all of a sudden, down you go. Yeah. Verse nine, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so he can encourage others. Doctor, yeah. So often we read here and say, well, I think this, or it could be this, but he's saying, no, it's what it is taught. Yeah. There's, it teaches, Jesus teaches this, not I think this. Yeah. Yeah. I can't say it any better than that. Yeah. That there is a right way and there's a wrong way. So you can see everything I've been saying is the opposite of postmodernism. I don't mind postmodernism for music and art, but in the church, postmodernism has no place. Uh, there is one, one right way. I'll admit there's a few passages that we don't know what they mean, <laughs> and so there's speculation. But for the most part, most passages are very clear, and they are. The apostolic teaching was, yeah, things aren't always clear. Mm -hmm. They're unanswered, and that's where you leave it. Yeah. You don't try to interpose your thoughts. Yeah. What, what you know. Yeah, and that's been, I like the Lutheran approach, is if it's unknown, I simply say I don't know. There could be some possibilities, but I still don't know. Uh, like the question that came up, how old will you be in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> So, so the, the quick answer is, 
uh, you'll be perfect. So that'll be good enough. Or, or some will say, well, you'll be the like Jesus. So he was 33. <laughs> yeah. But, well, yeah, they, they think of that. That's like the old question, um, how many uh, angels can dance on the tip of a needle? Again. Augustine will address that issue. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the scripture is very clear on salvation, sin, what the Christian life looks like, and sanctification. That, that there's no wiggle room. So, well, let's, let's close with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Uh, keep us strong in you and give us confidence in your word that what we have is true. And Lord, we pray that it, that you would help us live that life out, uh, bearing good fruit in our lives uh, by your Holy Spirit, that we would produce those gifts of love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and, and so forth. Uh, forgive us where we fail and give us joy knowing that we are yours um, and part of your narrow way. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Oh. Yeah, here's the stuff. Don't do this. <laughs> okay. Some of the passages we don't understand, such as the New Testament, there are reasons they're obscure. Because the writers were under the Roman Empire. They had to be very careful. That's what they said. Yeah. It be, would be misinterpreted. They're happy to come up. Yeah, especially uh, Book of Revelation. Uh, a lot of that is written in apocalyptic language purely so that people wouldn't understand it. That's right. Yeah, and that way, but if you know your scriptures, Revelation isn't bad. It's pretty straightforward. But it's, it's still, it leaves some questions for us still today. Yeah. Well, Barbie, we'll see you later. Good to have you with us this morning.